Hello, everyone. So, uh, thank you so much for coming today. I am Victoria. I'm an artist working at Pickpock here in Wellington. And my talk is called Burn the Bikini Armor, Actionable Tips for Better, Character to Co for Better Costume Design in Games. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about bikini armor and a lot about costume design, and hopefully some of the talking will be useful tips. And it probably comes as a surprise to absolutely nobody that I have a long-standing and deep love of clothes, of fashion, of costume design, and of the history of clothes. Now, this isn't really something that I have applied to my career in games, but it is something that I have cultivated outside of it. So for almost a decade, I have actively researched fashion history, costume design, all kinds of sewing techniques, both modern and old-fashioned. I wear my collection of vintage reproduction and handmade clothes from the 1930s to the 1950s every single day, as I'm sure some of you have noticed. And I have made garments from the late 18th century, which I don't wear every day, um, including corsets, petticoats, aprons, and I've even made my own pair of shoes. Much of this can be found on my semi-popular blog, which mostly features pictures of me in old-fashioned underwear. <laughs> so for the academic side of things, I've been devouring every fashion history book I can come across since I was 11 years old. And I'm part of a very niche but very awesome community of historical costumers who pioneer research in their fields and educate the public about the past through fashion, naturally. Now, some notes before we begin. Firstly, this talk will lean heavily towards historic fashion from Western cultures, because this is where my area of interest lies and it's where I've done the most research. And it's often what goes horribly wrong the most. I've made sure to include as wide a range of examples and references as I can, as the time allows, though. Secondly, I'm using character design and costume design somewhat interchangeably, but they aren't the same thing. Character design obviously encompasses way more than just costume design, and the but the clothing is going to be fo what I'm going to be focusing on, because again, that is what I know best. Also, characters in games don't really change outfits, so they tend to get in the sort of stuck in the iconic outfit trope more often than other media. And lastly, I may get salty. Uh, it's always hard to see something you love mangled and ignored in equal measure, but I'm promised to make it fun. So, why is this important? Why should you care? Fashion and dresses, that's just silly women things, right? So, you should care because clothes are universal. We all wear them, and for better or worse, they communicate our intentions and our interests. They influence how other people view us and how we view them. Even if you don't care about, you, about what you wear, you dress a certain way to show that information to the rest of the world. You're still part of the same display as the rest of us. There is no escaping clothes. And you should care because in video games, like all forms of media, clothes can become even more powerful. They can anchor us to a particular place or time. They can act as visual shorthand. They communicate ideas about the character, like who they are, where they're from, and what they like. They work within the larger context of the game as part of its theme, its mood, and its color palette. Your character designs are as important as the game mechanics and the UI and the setting, and they're part of the package that makes the game yours. And you should care because I hope that you already do. I know that Play by Play has always strived to be an inclusive and progressive conference, and I hope that you as attendees share those same values. Clothing, or more often lack of clothing, has been one of the visible issues when it comes to the representation of women and minorities in games. There are countless damaging tropes that relate to clothing and character design, and they persist despite resistance. And shouldn't we all try and be a better person tomorrow than we are today? So this leads us into looking at what's gone wrong when it comes to clothes and games. Now, there are different levels of wrongness, obviously, ranging from some of the more obvious examples to incorrect clothes for the time period or the tone of the game. Which leads me to my next slide. I don't really think I need to say any commentary. I'm just going to let us all like think about this for a minute. <laughs> So this probably seems like quite a trite example to use because we're all so used to seeing it. But if you look at this with fresh eyes for a second, you can see how ridiculous this is. And we all know this isn't an isolated example. I could easily fill these 30 minutes with equally terrible examples from gaming's short but storied history. There are the famously or infamously bad examples, the now iconic but still questionable examples, and the steady stream of what the fuckery that comes from all those free-to-play online MMOs. <laughs> Sometimes it feels like every game ends up being a variation of this. 
It's boring. <laughs> It's certainly not creative, no matter how much freedom you have with it. It's insulting, pandering, damaging, and it just plain sucks. And I have not even begun to talk about historical or historically inspired clothing. Movies and TV shows get a lot of things wrong, but sometimes it feels like video games don't even try. If your game starts with a fade from black and a historical date on the screen, I'm going to expect you to have done some research into what people wore back then. Otherwise, what is the point of having a specific setting? Assassin's Creed, oh, okay, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> so, for any sort of cohesive world design, you're going to need something that I call a costume language. This is the thread that runs through your entire game and your entire world. It's the stylistic choices that you make that keep everything consistent and unified. Silhouettes or patterns or colors can be used again and again across different characters, linking everything together while still describing individual roles. This all sounds a bit wishy-washy, so it's easier to explain with examples. So, here we go. We are going to be talking about the Banner Saga again. <laughs> the Banner Saga by, so by Stoic is an absolutely beautiful game with a textbook example of a strong costume language. The Banner Saga obviously takes a lot of inspiration from general Viking mythology, which was between the 8th and the 11th centuries. Comparing the characters side by side, you can easily see that they have a very cohesive designs and they all look like they belong in the same universe. Now, a small disclaimer, the Banner Saga's art is completely hand-drawn and all the animation was rotoscoped, so a lot of these characters look like palette swap designs just to make it easier on the artists, but it's still a good example to look at. So, take these characters here. They all have the same silhouettes appearing in their designs. The women have a simple tunic dress and a short cape that covers their arms. Capes also appear on the male characters, but they tend to be longer, maybe ankle length. And the male characters have shorter tunics that are worn with pants. The horned giants have the same tunics, but with shorter sleeves, more layers, and they're often held together by large buckles. These are very simple ingredients, but they're consistent across the entire cast of characters in the game to create cohesion. Now, once you add once you have simple ingredients like silhouette down, then you can start to add color. So the Banner Saga has a color palette of whites and blues, reds and yellows, browns, blacks, and other neutrals. These colors are used across all the characters in different intensities and combinations. It makes it very easy to communicate character traits, loyalties, and the character's place in the world. Once you've got a strong color palette, it makes it really easy to put together a new outfit for a new character while matching it up to that character's unique traits. Having a defined color palette also makes it really easy to identify important or unusual characters, or whatever your game narrative needs. Like Alette in the top corner is in green, and maybe she's one of the main characters and is important because she's wearing green and nobody else is. I don't know. <laughs> and then we have patterns. The artists have probably done their research here as we see the same key Viking and Nordic stylings appearing throughout the whole game. Patterns inspired by Nordic art are added into clothes, jewelry, there's leather wraps and other decorations that are used as well. Primary characters or other important players are marked out by their more detailed costumes, standout jewelry, patterned cloth or even more buckles. Secondary characters have texture applied to their costumes with simple buckles and brooches. All of these come together in one big delicious cake mix to create the costuming language for the Banner Saga. Once something like this is in place, it is much easier to keep coming up with new costumes that fit into your world. Instead of the simple dress tunic, the new female character might have a version of the male tunic, or instead of a cape, the character could have a hooded robe, but it would all still fit. A good costume language is going to help you so much, and it will help you with characterization, with concepting it, and it will make it much quicker and easier to come up with new designs for secondary or background, or background characters. And it will make things look right, even if the player only realizes it on a subconscious level. So, we've covered the first point in my things to learn slide, which is we've looked at how creating a good costuming language can help your game. So we're going to look at the individual parts in more detail, which is the individual parts that make up a good costuming language. So, first port of call is primary sources. What are primary sources? Primary sources are artifacts, documents, diaries, manuscripts, recordings, or any other source of information that was created during the time that you are studying. They are the original things that you're looking at. So, anybody here who is an artist has probably had this drilled into them, but I'm going to say this anyway. Use primary sources, please. 
<laughs> you can't create anything without references, and even the most stylistically out there artwork is going to have weak design without references. You can't extrapolate or remix or model or remodel or create your own amazing fantasy, feminist, whale punk, steampunk, post apocalyptic universe without those references first. As Picasso once said, it took me four years to, paint, to learn to paint like Raphael, but it took me a lifetime to learn how to paint like a child. To know where you're going, you need to know what's come before you. So when it comes to games costume design, you are in luck. There are countless examples of clothing from every time period, every continent, and every culture to look at. As long as humans have been making images of themselves, there have been humans wearing clothes that have been made into images of humans wearing clothes. So you should probably look at one or two of the images, maybe two, three, that'd be good. And if your game is set after the 17th century, you are even luckier still, because there are lots of actual clothes from the past three centuries that still exist, which is pretty cool. And another thing I really want to stress is that you shouldn't apply modern standards to old designs. There is a lot of weird-looking shit out there that we have worn in the past. Not everything will be to your taste, but sometimes it is integral to the look of the period. You shouldn't go in with the intention of changing everything to be sexy by today's standards. Instead, take the weird shit and use it as a springboard for something new and something interesting. Just remember to have some perspective and ask yourself why someone might have worn that back then and what importance it might have had to them. Next up, we have time period. It's rare that games have very specific settings. There are countless games with a vaguely medieval fantasy kind of setting, and they look like they could be set anywhere between the 10th and the 16th centuries, which is like six whole centuries of difference. So my general rule for time periods is to know them. The past tends to get blurred into, <laughs> into one big lump of ye olden days. Um, there are pinpoints along it, but it's a long and meandering timeline. Some of these pinpoints are burned into public, public consciousness thanks to media like movies repeatedly going over the same things again and again. Usually these are your, your generic settings like World War II or Ancient Egypt. And if you're making something like a game with the ubiquitous setting of Victorian London, know what part of London and what part of the Victorian era you actually want. Queen Victoria ruled for over 63 years, and fashion changed dramatically over that time period. You probably think of something like this when you hear the Victorian era, sort of the big frothy bustle gowns that kind of look like curtains, and maybe you saw it at a convention once and it was called steampunk. Um, but then when she became queen, fashions actually looked more like this. The 1830s were a very weird time in fashion. Everyone just sort of looked like they were melting and they had tiny heads. <laughs> so if your game is set in feudal Japan, for example, pick a dynasty and narrow it down from there. Being vague about things is only going to make your life harder. And also, if you think you know when your game is set, please double check. I get times and dates and things mixed up all the time. And you might be saying that your game is set in one era, but you're actually 100 years out. So now we've covered creating a costume language and researching time periods and proper sources. And my hot tip for both of these points is please do them. <laughs> and now we can move on to the next stage where we can actually start to put a costume together. So the silhouette. Silhouettes are incredibly important. They describe form, the form of an object in your game, the very space that it takes up in the world. Distinctive silhouette design is something that any game artist needs to take into account because it allows the player to quickly pass the information on the screen. For a fast-paced, visually dense, or action-heavy games, this is even more important. So in fashion design, silhouette is often the very first thing a designer puts down on the page. They often design new clothes in black first, so the shapes and the weight of the clothing take center stage. And then you go back in and you add texture and color. And you probably already know a lot of key clothing silhouettes without realizing it. So let's start with an easy one, mid-century dresses. This dress I'm wearing right now, it has petticoats to fill out the skirt, giving it that distinctive bell shape of the 1950s. Another one, bell-bottom jeans, you instantly think 1970s. Shoulder pads, you think of the 80s, et cetera, et cetera. You already have a ton of really basic silhouette knowledge. And each silhouette anchors the clothing in a particular time period, place, and mood. Just like the 20th century, every other, every other century has distinctive silhouettes that will help you really sell your character designs. 
So, silhouettes for historical clothing is exactly the same. It just takes a bit more research to really get there. So let's start with one of my favorite time periods, the late 1700s. This dress is a very typical example. How do you find an example like this? Remember one of our earlier points, primary sources. And at first glance, you're probably like, oh, this is just an old-fashioned dress. I don't know, it has big skirts, goes to the floor, who really cares? But perhaps the most famous defining era, famous and defining part of this era was the really wide skirts. If you're having a game set around this time period, it's going to be the key thing that your character art has to nail. The bodice is almost triangular shaped and the neckline is very square and low cut. These are, all of, these are all just simple shapes that would be very easy to incorporate into your design. The length of things is important to look at here as well. The skirt ends at the ankle and the sleeves always ended at about elbow length. Now this is an extremely quick analysis. I did this just using simple shapes and something I found on Google Images. But you can really go in depth just by looking at what you have in front of you. So let's apply this to a game. This is the game Shadowhand by Grey Alien Games. It is an as yet unreleased RPG that is conveniently set during the same time period as the dress that we just did a quick analysis of. So first let's take a look at the character on the right. She's wearing a dress quite similar to the blue one that we just looked at. Um, and it hits a lot of the right beats that it needs to. The bodice is an inverted triangle shape, which is great. Although it does conform to her body instead of being rigid, it doesn't really look like she's wearing a corset under there. And the neckline is square, which is perfect. And it's kind of hard to see, but it does look like she has shorter sleeves. The sleeves in this era often had giant frills on the end of them that could reach down to your wrist, so I'll give them a pass. And perhaps the most important part of the silhouette is the wide hips, which are shown perfectly here, even though it's covered by a text box. And this isn't something we've covered before, but her hair is in a style that's pretty close to the period. So all in all, it's a good example of the late 1700s done in a game. But if we look at the character on the left... <laughs> um, this is something I like to call leading lady syndrome. Um, you see it a lot in film and in games as well sometimes. The main character often gets dressed in a completely inaccurate outfit and it's very conventionally sexy and modern and pretty like that. And all the background characters get more accurate outfits because they're considered frumpy. And the main issue here is that her corset is 100 years out of date, the style that she's wearing, which is what most people think of when you say a corset, you think of something like that. But that wouldn't have been worn until the latter half of the next century. Also, her hair is down, and I can't figure out like, what the hell her sleeves are attached to, if they're attached to her hair. And the pants, <laughs> the pants look a bit too well fitted to be accurate because she's supposed to be wearing men's pants. I don't know. So they gave the character design a good shot here, and some parts of it are refreshingly well done, but some are less, less successful. And it does go to show how a good understanding of silhouettes, basic shapes, and using primary sources can be a good starting block from which to build from. And then, yeah, so we studied silhouette and constructing outfits. So after you've got the silhouette, which is sort of the base of the outfit, then you can go on to color and pattern. And this is what you should be adding once your silhouette is locked down, because this is what's going to go on top of it. And if you don't have a strong silhouette, then it's just going to make everything else a bit mushy, and it's not really going to work, but you're not going to know why. So this is, nowadays, you can get clothes in almost any color imaginable, but that hasn't always been the case. So oh, I went too far forward. So, dye, colors, patterns, and designs, and types of fabric have been discovered and invented as technology keeps marching onwards. Now, unless you're making a particularly historically accurate game, you're not going to have to worry you're not going to have to worry about the exact fiber content of your character's clothing. That would be a bit weird. But it is good to be aware of the larger trends and developments in colors and patterns, and it can help give your game that look that you really want to nail. So. Aniline is an organic compound that was first used as the first synthetic dye in 1856. The screamingly bright purples, pinks, greens, and reds of the late Victorian period all owe their existence to this discovery, including the modern clothes that we wear today. Although bold colors did exist before the 1850s, they were nowhere near as reliable, bright, or commonplace. It tended to be much easier to achieve colors like yellow. And if your game is taking inspiration from somewhere before the 1850s, it might be a good idea to look at what colors were even achievable. 
Patterns, they are another aspect that is often overlooked. Popular patterns have, come, have to come from somewhere, and before globalization and the mass markets of the past 100 years, patterns were determined by trade routes and by fashion. What we now call paisley originated in Persia, and it wasn't introduced in the West until the 17th century by traders from India, and it reached the peak of its popularity in about the 19th century, so that's the Victorian era. Floral fabrics have been worn for centuries. Um, they probably originated from 12th century East Asia and traveled through the West, through the, to the West through Ottoman and Italian trade routes in the 17th century. Something like polka dots, they are a very modern pattern. Early examples only appear as far back as the mid 1800s. It's common knowledge that tartan patterns represent ancient Scottish families, except for the part where they don't. Um, assigning tartan patterns to clans is a very Victorian invention, and what we consider tartan wasn't really even around until the 1600s. So color and pattern. Color, um, there are powerful ways of anchoring your characters in a particular time and place. Even if you're not doing history by the book, there is a wealth of symbolism, framework, and existing attributes around color and patterns that can be taken apart and reassembled in new and interesting ways. I'm sure you all know, at least in passing, of different associations color can have. Red for danger, blue is calming, green for nature, etc., etc. You don't have to stick to these at all, and indeed you probably shouldn't, but they are good to keep in, your back, in the back of your mind all the same. So we have covered what a costume language is, what goes into it. We've looked at researching the proper time period, using primary sources, studying silhouettes, and then putting colors and patterns on top of the silhouettes. And now we're briefly gonna look at style and taste. This is something I very quickly want to touch on. We've gone through how to build up a costume from the basics, which I hope is simple enough for everyone to have understood and gone along with. And style and taste is kind of how you add character to your design. So style is often seen as quite a nebulous thing, but I think it can pretty easily be defined as a preference for certain colors, silhouettes, fabrics, things like that. Style doesn't have to mean that it looks good or that it's tasteful, it's simply, the elephant, it's simply the elements that a certain character might gravitate towards. Someone like, uh, does your character love to wear blue or all black outfits? Do they wear loose drapey clothes or tight constricting ones? And all of these go towards creating a character design which has personality and style. And finally, a brief note on corsets. <laughs> They're often wrongly used more than any other item of clothing. Okay, firstly, corsets do not hurt by default. If it hurts, you are wearing it wrong and it's your fault. <laughs> and if I hear one more quip from a strong independent female character about how much corsets hurt and how much they suck, I will scream. I hate that trope, don't do it. Corsets are there to support the dress and create the silhouette of the time period. All of these massive skirts, they're really heavy. You need a corset to take that weight off your back and your shoulders or you're gonna have a really bad time. Most women's clothes pre-20th century don't physically work without a corset. They, weren't, they were designed as part of the whole ensemble that someone would wear. So it's not what we're used to now, but that is why you need to be researching your primary sources. Secondly, there is no such thing as a generic corset. There is just as there is no such thing as a generic gun. When gun models, they often get proper research and love poured into them. Most corsets though, they're generic leather Renaissance fair bodice things or a very modern interpretation of a Victorian corset. The world of corsets is as complex as the world of guns. Since coming into vogue in the early 16th century, there have been many different types of corset. In fact, the word corset only refers to versions from the 1830s onward. Before that, they were called stays or bodies. Each change shown here is to support the changing silhouette of women's clothes and to use new technology and new sewing techniques. When most people think of corsets, they think hourglass shaped and they think of steel bones that hold everything in shape. But this was a very small period of time in the long and storied history of corsets. If your game is set before the 1920s, you're going to need to research what was around during your chosen period and how that influenced the silhouette. And if you're creating a fantasy world or mixing and matching eras, there are so many interesting looks to choose from. So don't just settle on a generic corset, your game really deserves better. And now for what I know some of you are expecting and or hoping I would include in this presentation. The quick fire round of awful costume things that I keep seeing in games and please stop doing these. <laughs> 
So, we've already been here. Renaissance Fair corsets. Again, I really cannot stress enough. Give your corsets a purpose. Don't just put them in there to look medieval or to cover up a female character's midriff because you don't know how clothes work. Your corsets are shitty. Do better. <laughs> Boo bomber. It hurts. It looks stupid. It will kill you. I'm sure this is common knowledge by now, but any sort of blow to the chest while wearing this will crush your sternum. Not to mention the armor shape like this would take way more time and be much harder to make with medieval tools than normal armor. Heels, they're not part of a woman's anatomy. <laughs> Believe it or not, we are capable of walking with flat feet. It, it is rare, but it does happen. If all your women are in practical high heels, maybe reconsider that approach. If all your women are hovering on proto-ballerina toes, definitely reconsider your approach. Midriffs, they keep coming up, I'm not sure why. Especially in military situations. It's not the 90s anymore, there is clothing that covers your midsection out there, please use it. Boob socks. If your character's boobs are separately encased in specially made pockets, I implore you to take a few minutes to go and look at pictures of real boobs and how they look under clothing. It will be fun and educational, I promise. <laughs> Sad hair. Women wearing their hair down is a very modern thing in the grand scheme of things. Not only is it much more accurate, but it is also much easier to give your characters updos or hats or some sort of head covering. Think about it, no messing around with hair physics. Why does the rich lady have a sad ponytail? Who knows, can she not afford a maid? I don't know. <laughs> Disapparate stylization. Because men are allowed to have interesting, exaggerated body shapes, but women must be fit and fit the mold of being pretty and thin. If you're going to pick a more extreme look for your characters, be consistent with it across all genders. Cleavage windows. They look stupid. <laughs> and I imagine your boobs would get cold really easily, and also did I mention they look really stupid? Backlacing. It's more than likely that the historical dress you're taking inf inspiration from was done up from the front. There are many interesting reasons for this that I won't go into here, but I will say that backlacing is the visible panty line of historical clothing, so maybe you should avoid that. If you're going to put makeup on your female characters, learn what makeup is, please. <laughs> Even if it's going on YouTube and watching a few tutorials, it will help you so much. Eyeliner should ma not make you look like a raccoon, and oh my god, please learn where blush goes. <laughs> okay, I get it. Boots are much sexier than little slippers, but for most of history, men wore shoes and not boots. They only really wore boots when they went out hunting. Boots go well with leather pants, but maybe you should try and mix it up a little bit. If your character looks like they have raided Lady Gaga's closet and they aren't actually Lady Gaga, then please reconsider your choice, because it is just really jarring to see stuff like this. If any part of your design <laughs> belongs on this bingo card, please reconsider. This bingo card is from the wonderful website Bikini Armor Battle Damage, and I highly recommend you check it out. It applies to armor more than anything, but it is still really fun. If your game is set in a cold environment, <laughs> please dress everyone appropriately, and no, a bikini with fur trim does not count as appropriate dress. And finally, tactical butt cheeks. <laughs> I, they have been making the game news a lot recently, and yet developers keep seem to make mo Keep, seem to keep making models with impossibly deep asses. <laughs> Go and look at how lycra or neoprene actually looks on a human body. It usually stretches over everything. However, real life male special forces, they often have some tight pants and they wear a lot of harnesses. So in the name of realism, maybe we should be re reconsidering how we approach our male characters in games. If you're going to give your ladies tactical butt cheats, then why can't everyone have them? <laughs> Tactical butt cheats for all, that's, that's the conclusion of this talk. <laughs> but to conclude properly, there is a lot of shitty character designs and costumes out there, and there is a lot of tropes to avoid. Remember the things that we talked, remember the things that we covered in this talk and the points that I've covered when you're making costumes. I hope that they were insightful and proved useful to you all. And I'll probably put these slides up somewhere, but if not, it's being recorded, so who cares? And this has been my talk, Burn, Burn, the, Bikini, Burn the Bikini Armor, Actionable Tips for Better Character Design. You can find me on Twitter at the Lady Victoria. Come talk to me about video games and costumes and corsets and stuff, it'll be really fun. It has been a pleasure being here. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and thank you very much.